see you all. Nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, for those who I haven't met yet, uh, my name is Fraser Scott, I'm the Executive Director of Bright Hope World, and I hope to uh, meet each and every person I haven't met um, tonight or tomorrow. Um, but it's, it's a real pleasure to have you here. We don't get to do this very often. I think, uh, I was trying to work out this afternoon, I think this is our fourth Bright Hope World Summit. Can anyone from Bright Hope World come with me on that? I think this is our fourth. We do them every two years, uh, and this is our fourth one. So it's, it's a pretty rare thing for us to get a bunch of people together, and it's, uh, it's a real privilege. It's a bit of work for the team, but it's a real privilege to uh, bring everyone in and, and uh, have time together like this. And I wanted to, I'm going to do some housekeeping stuff, but I wanted to start off by kind of explaining for us what this is about, why we do this summit. Because, you know, it, it would be easy to think that we do this to talk about us and, and, and what we do, but that's kind of not really it. Uh, and we tell partner stories and, and you know, that, that's important to us, but that's not really it either. And we certainly want to bring you, our supporters, in and, and thank you, but that's not really it either. And, and what really occurred to me is, you know, we in, in Bright Hope World, and it's, it, Kind of feels like a cliche, but I said anyway, we really are a family. I mean, that's how we interact. That's how we feel together is, is that we're a family. And we're the family members that we get to go and connect with our partners internationally. We get to see what God is doing around the world. And, and not all of you get to do that. And so because we connect with, with you as, as part of our broader team, as family, it's such an exciting opportunity for us to be able to come and, and, and share what bubbles up inside us, share what we see God doing around the world. That's, that's what this is about, is us sharing what God is doing around the world. That's what gets us up in the morning. That's what excites us. That's what we're part of. And so it's a real privilege to be able to do that. And, and I hope you get to talk to all of the Bright Hope World team and hear stories from different places because God is working in the world in exciting and new and encouraging ways, and it really is a privilege for us to be involved in it. Now, as I say, this is our fourth Bright Hope World Summit. Each time we've done it, we've had a bit of a theme. Last time, if you were here, our theme was uh, our values. We talked about our values as an organization and, and what each of those means and, and what drives us. But this time, we are talking about what it means uh, to be sustainable. And I'll explore that in a minute. But I just wanted to, before I kick into things, um, just draw your attention to this book. Did everyone get one of these books? Because all of this, all of the stuff you're going to see up there uh, tonight and tomorrow is all in this book. And we do that so that you don't have to write down all the terribly clever things that we say. Uh, you can just you can just focus and enjoy yourselves and know that you have a record of it there. You also have the, the program. <laughs> and stuff about our team and our values and stuff as well. So if you don't have one of those, there'll be more over there, please do get it uh, and um, follow along with, with what it is that we're talking about. So, sustainable. That is our theme this uh, year, this summit. Now, I'm guessing for uh, different people, sustainable means different things. And you may have seen it and wondered if we'd suddenly become super green as an organization and we're really pursuing an environmental bent. That's kind of what it means in the public consciousness. Uh, and, you know, there are different ones amongst us that are very passionate about recycling. I'm thinking of the, the bombings, uh, you know, particularly very excited about all that eco stuff. But that's, that's not what we're really talking about when we talk about uh, sustainability and being sustainable. And this is not something new for us either. And, and I want to explain why that is. Because, is this going to work? Hang on. I'm going to need someone to, to man the computer for me in that case. Oh, no, no, we're away. We're away. All is well. All is well. Um, as I said, last time we were, we were all together like this, we talked about our values. And I thought I'd just touch on those again because we, we refer to them as if you all know what they are. We talk about our values all the time. So it seemed prudent to start off and maybe remind you what, what those values are. We, are uh, we have a focus on the poorest of the poor. That should come as a surprise to no one. That's what we do. We focus on the poorest of the poor. All of our ministry is focused on the poor of the poor, and we defend that jealously because 
that's the people that we feel that God has called us to focus on. And we invest in strategic partnerships. That's, that's what we do. We're relational. We're relational people. And new relational people. And, and you know that we're about partnership. That's, that's how we do ministry. And we are field-driven. We don't let anything override the preeminence, the importance of the field in our decision-making. We do everything uh, with the field in mind, with the people at the other end in mind, taking the, the, the primary importance in everything that we do. And we're committed to a low overhead structure, the uh, standard of the meal notwithstanding. We don't spend money on flash cars and flash offices and, and I was going to say flash people then, but that, that's not exactly what I mean. Uh, we're, we're, we're simple folk and we, we, we're, we're not interested in having a, a great big unwieldy organisation. We just, we're a thin veneer on top. We're here for our partners, not for uh, our surroundings. But then there's that other value. We emphasize, oh, it hasn't come up. Oh, um, there's a dangerous message. Shall I... Oh, there we go. It's all my lady's have like a computer. I don't know what to tell him over there. But anyway, we emphasize sustainability. That's one of our values. We want things to be sustainable. So I want to explain what it is that we mean by sustainability. So we're all on the same page, and when we talk about it over the next 24 hours or so, you know what it is that we're referring to. And then I want to talk about why we pursue it, how we pursue it, and how it, it, it infiltrates everything that we do and think about. So what is sustainability? Now, these are, these are some definitions. I'll put these up. These are some things I found on the internet when I was just searching for a good satisfactory definition of sustainability that we could get behind as an organisation. So you see there, sustainability is the ability to continue a defined behaviour indefinitely. Well, that seems fairly intuitive. Fair enough, I suppose. If an activity is said to be sustainable, it should be able to continue forever. All right, fair enough. This, this one I quite like. This, is, this has got some interesting elements. Sustainable communities foster commitment to place, whatever that means, promote vitality, build resilience to stress, act as stewards, and forge connections beyond the community. Well, I like that. That's got some good elements in it. But when we're looking at this and we're thinking, well, what is our definition of sustainability as an organization? Uh, Kevin and I had a bit of a conversation about this, and this is what we came up with. This is what we mean when we talk about sustainability. I mean, working in partnership with God and exceptional people, and by that we mean our partners, to empower current and future generations so they can provide for their own physical and spiritual needs. That's what we mean by sustainability. And a couple of things, we're going to drill down in this in all kinds of different directions tomorrow, but a couple of things I'll draw your attention to. It starts with God. None of this works without God. Nothing is sustainable without God. When you hear people talking about sustainability and God isn't part of it, they're fooling themselves. God sustains everything. And without God as part of the picture, without God at the centre of the picture, it doesn't work. But for us, without the exceptional people, it doesn't work so well either. We want God in the centre, but we want our partners right there that are, that are intimately connected with God. That's how we believe sustainability and mission happens, is with those exceptional, extraordinary people called by God with a vision given by God, and those are the people that we want to get behind. And then it's about what's happening now, but it's also about what's happening in the future. We want to build intergenerational community transformation we want things to happen now that are going to flow forward to the next generation, to eternity. And that's what we're trying to build uh, with Bright Hope World and our partners. And I, have a, I don't need to say this, this is, this is our calling card, I hope, is we believe in holistic ministry. We want to meet physical needs. We want to see people clothed and, and have a roof over their head and, and, and fed. But the spiritual side of things is, is everything. And we want people to be able to provide for their own spiritual needs, to be able to get into the Word, to be able to you know, go and meet with other believers, to be able to sustain themselves spiritually as well. It brings all of that in. And so that's a pretty good definition. There's a lot of stuff represented in those few words, but that's what we're talking about. That's what we mean by sustainability. And I want to talk a little bit about four aspects of sustainability. The four kind of things that we do to ensure that the work that we do with our partners is sustainable. 
and these are them. No? Oh, there we go. Four key aspects of sustainability. First is we want to pursue empowerment, not dependency. I won't explain each of these in a minute, but I'll put them up so that I, they're a little bit familiar to you. We want to pursue resilience, not reliance. Partnership, not dominance. And we want to be feel-driven, not me-driven. These are the things that if we can achieve empowerment, resilience, partnership, and being feel-driven, then, then we maximise our chances of what we're doing being sustainable, carrying on, and providing for future generations. So let me talk about... Here we go. Let me talk about the first one, empowerment, not dependency. Now, has anyone read the book Toxic Charity? I know there'll be a few keen bright hopers that have read it. It's a great book. Highly recommend it. Toxic Charity. You Google it, you find it. And there's some great stuff in there. And there's there's a there's a cool little sort of mantra. I think this first heard to get a talk about this. And I really like it. That talks about giving and the progression of giving. So you give once and you elicit, elicit appreciation. Right? You give to someone you see, someone on the street, you, you give them something, you elicit appreciation. Like, well, thank you. That's, that's, that's very kind. And then you give twice, and you create anticipation. You gave to me, maybe, maybe there's a third gift. That would be quite nice. I, you know, I'm quite excited about that. And then you give three times, and you create expectation. Well, like, you know, if it was a third time, I would, you know, it's going to be a fourth. I expect that now. That's, that's a reasonable thing to expect. And then you give four times, and it becomes entitlement. Well, darn it, this, this is only right that I get this gift. This thing needs to come to me. I... I deserve it. And then you give five times and you establish dependency. Now, my life is oriented around this giving. I need this to, to survive. This is, this is where I'm rooted and oriented. Now, just to be clear, this doesn't actually work in real life like that. You can't think, right, I need to stop at four and I'm fine. That's, that's not really how it works. I hope it's clear. I don't need to explain that. But, but the fact is, when we pursue... Uh, a handout model. This is the route it takes. When, when you create this relationship between us here in the West, the, do the donors, the ones with the resources, and the poor, and, and you're handing out like this over and over again, you create dependency. You create this relationship where they are dependent on us, intimately linked to us in a way that's just not that helpful. Because dependency... Oh. <clears throat> there we go. Dependency is not sustainable. Now, I hope that's obvious, but I'll explain why. You won't keep doing that forever. You know, at least of all us, us here in Western studies, we grow tired of this. The emotional payoff has what they call in economics diminishing marginal return. It's not as good the six and the seven of the time. So you stop doing it. Now, if you talk to anyone that's involved in... in child support. You ask them, how long do people support children for, on average, and, uh, with ministries like TFM and Google Vision? You'd be shocked how short it is, because people get bored. So when you, you create that dependency relationship, and then what are we in the West doing? We go, nah, I don't want to do that anymore. But they're dependent. We've created a dependency. It's not sustainable. But what does it do to people at the other end? Now, you know, I think there's, I've had lots of conversations over the last eight or so years with, with people about um, missions and ministry. And, and I think it's quite easy to see the people over there, the poor, almost like a different species. I hate to say that, but that's how sometimes the, the conversations go. Like, these people are quite different from us. They're not. These are people just like us. How do you think it feels for them to be constantly asking for a handout? What do you think that does for a person? Now, another book plug, if you've read it, When Helping Hurts, you, you'll have seen the, the discussion on what poverty does to a person, what it does to their, their sense of self-worth, to their connection with God, their connection with, with communities. When people are in that situation, it erodes who they are, it erodes their soul, it does something to their, just their sense of self, their relationship with God. And when we allow dependency take over from empowerment, it's what we're contributing to. We're destroying people. But when we pursue 
empowerment, when we enable people to, to go off and do stuff, things go viral. I mean, I, I was, I was going to say tonight how many microloans programs are connected to Bright Hope World in some way, or how many foundations for farming groups or, or trainings. I don't know. I don't think any of us know. Because these things create a life of their own. When you empower people and you teach these skills and they get passed on from person to person and things snowball. People are empowered. They're going and doing their own thing. They don't, they don't need us. They're not dependent on us anymore. They're going and doing their own thing. That's what, that's what empowerment is about. People being, God willing, in charge of their own destiny. People being able to provide for themselves. That's what we want to see with sustainability. So, what are the alternatives to dependency and handouts? And I want to tell just, just a few stories, just things that I reflect upon when I think about our partners in relation to these issues. Now, the first thing, oh, I can't read that very well. First thing that we do to focus on empowerment rather than dependency is that we promote income generation, not service funding. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. In the past, in, in Bright Hope World, we had funded schools. And we, we still live a little bit, but more time parts. We would pay for a kids' education. We would pay an amount to the school for that group of kids, and that was for their fees, the uniforms. Oh, thank you. Excellent. And so we would fund the service. Now, there was a, a, a school in Zambia, Zambia where this, this happened. Kevin, was it a school that we funded? No, okay, good. That, that's good, because not a big story. Now, a bunch of the kids in the school were funded externally by Westerns, and then a bunch were, their the parents paid fees for them to go to the school. And some of the teachers, well, not, not such wonderful people. And so the teachers would say to the, to the young girls who were funded to go to the school, if you want to pass your exams, you're going to pass your mark, you, you'll, you'll sleep with them. That's what they had to do. And the girls would go in and say to their parents, this is what's going on. The parents had no power. They couldn't do anything. They didn't pay fees. Teachers didn't care what those parents did. They were disempowered. They have no influence. They have nothing to say in that kind of situation. So what we do instead in these situations is we don't, we don't fund the service, which can disempower the people around it, be it a school or whatever it is. We want to focus on income generation for the community, for the people. So instead of funding the kids to go to school, we want to work with parents and help them get kick-started with, with a microloan or a foundation for farming, or whatever it is, so they can pay the fees for their kids to go to school and they're in control. Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't that, doesn't that just seem kind of obvious? Well, that's, that's what we mean by empowerment, not dependency. Because once it happens, once people, once people get going, we're, not, we're often not part of the picture anymore. We don't know what happens. But people are on their feet and, and providing for themselves in a sustainable way. Second uh, thing that we do to ensure empowerment, not dependency, is that we promote economic participation, not welfare. And that's what a handout is. When, when, you, when you're just, just giving where it's, it's not appropriate, you're just creating welfare, which is, I'm sure you, know, you hear that talked about, in this country. And so this, this picture, by the way, is a group of uh, ties, Northern Hill Tribe ties, and this is a microline program they're involved in. So with these people who are struggling to feed their families, we can give them some food, and sell that a bit of food. We could give them a bit of handout, that might put some iron on the roof. But our focus, again, is, is enabling people to participate fully in the economy just like we do. That's what microenterprise micro does. It enables people to get started, to, to be able to build something that they themselves have done. Not only does it typically uh, enable them to provide for their families, but also it does something to the heart. I mean, I hope this doesn't sound sensitive, but for me in particular, if you can't provide for your family, that hits your heart. It does something to a, to a man not to be able to provide for his family. Guess what? These guys are no different. And when they can, they can get a loan and they can build a business, and they can pay that loan back, and they have paid it back, and then continue to grow that business. What do you think that does to, to families and communities? Well, that's empowerment, and that's a heck of a lot better than dependency. 
Now, the second key aspect of sustainability that we really believe in, that we really pursue, is resilience, not reliance. And here's a, here's a, a, a news flash. We, we are not rescuers. That is not our role in Bright Hope World, in the church, in the West. It's not our role to rescue people. It's, it's not what we're about. We are not the white knights that are going to fill our pockets with money and charge into Africa and Asia and dole out that cash and solve all the problems of people in those countries. That's, that's not what we're called to do. It's, it's not what we do. It doesn't work, for one thing. And see, the problems that are there are not often financial in nature. And when we, we barge in with money and we, we dole it out, we create such chaos. And again, referring to the, um, the book, I'll put this up, uh, Toxic Charity, there's an interesting quote there. It says, food in our society is a chronic poverty need. And chronic is a word that's usually often wrong. Chronic means over time. It, it, it's been there for a long time. It's not a life-threatening one. And when we respond to a chronic need as though it was a crisis, we can predict toxic results, dependency, deception, disempowerment. So many of the issues that we are grappling with with the Bright Hope world and with our partners, they're not new. They've been around an awful long time, and they're going to need bigger and more complex and more prayerful and more relational solutions then, then we, can, we can address just by throwing money at something. And the last thing that we want to do to try and address those problems is create a reliance on us. Instead, we want to build resilience in communities. And part of that is getting rid of this idea of, of us as the rescuers. We must never do for the poor what they can do for themselves. I want to say that again because I think it's a really important point. We must never do for the poor what they can do for themselves. Now, the next thing I'm going to say, I'm going to say advisedly, okay? I, I, I know I, I risk potentially ruffling fear this here, but I'm going to say it anyway because I feel it's the right thing to say. When we cross the world to go and paint a building or, or construct something in a community where those people are more than capable of doing it themselves, what on earth are we doing? Why would we do that? Are these people not capable of doing it? I mean, what, what, what message is that sending? We're, we're not building resilience. We're just communicating to these people. You know what? If you have a problem, just wait for us, and we'll come solve it. You don't have to worry about it. We'll come rescue you. That's not that's not our problem. What we're doing is building dependency. It's, we're building reliance on us. And what we are absolutely not doing is building sustainability in those We can't allow or encourage the people we're trying to help to become reliant on us. And you know what? I'll talk about this a little bit in a moment, but there is a big pull on us, whether we realise or not to do that. There's a big pull on us because it fulfills something in us when they're reliant on us. When, when, when we're needed, it makes us feel special. It makes us feel like we have a purpose or a calling. We can't allow that. We have to fight that temptation. We need to empower people to be resilient. We need to encourage people to be able to stand on their own two feet. And what we certainly can't do is that place of faith in God. If a person knows a disaster befalls me, Jerry will come and solve my problems. Then we're just playing God. We're just taking the place of God. We're taking the place of faith in God. People don't need to have faith in God in those situations because they know we'll show up and fix their problems. And you know what? That's not sustainable because we're not always going to be able to do that. So we, we can't allow that. So what are the alternatives to reliance on external support, to that addiction to funding from the rich white guys? Well, the first thing we can do is promote a long-term view, not a quick fix. This guy up here, and Kevin's going to talk a little bit more about him tomorrow. He's, he's a heck of a guy. His name's uh, Naranjan Adhikari, and he is, lives in Nepal. And you may recall, I ran about this time last year, April 
2015, there was a huge earthquake in the pool. 80,000 people killed, 21,000 people injured, untold people displaced and, and made homeless. And aid, as, as it does when, when we see these things on the news, aid flooded into uh, Nepal, and, and you know, we also reached out to many of you who also supported it. And all that, all, as we always do when a situation like this arises, we, we'll only work through a partner. And so we were working through one other chap, but mainly through Naranjan. And we talked to him, we had a conversation back and forth um, about what we were doing, and his response was to say, you know what, there's lots of stuff flowing into the port at the moment. There's you know, food and, and shelter and, and water, and it's all good. He said, but my focus is on what comes next. My focus is on how do we get these people back into work, these people that have lost their, their homes and their livelihoods. What can we do in terms of starting up some small businesses? How can we scan the environment and see what's possible for people to get back on their feet and, and start small businesses and, and, and think about the future? People can't just wait and, and get food parcels for people. We're going to be thinking about the future. That's what our partners are like. I don't know if I'd think like that. But he's, he's straight away he's thinking about what's going to be best for my people in the long term. We need to rebuild these communities. Well, that's sustainability in action. That's, that's what we're looking for when we form new partnerships. I'll tell you another story. I don't know if any of you read our newsletter. I know a lot of you get it, but I don't know if any of you read our newsletter. Uh, we, we told a story, and, and I think you're probably going to elaborate about Judas uh, tomorrow. We told a story in our last newsletter about a guy called Judas who's the treasurer uh, and, a, and a place called Chava on the, the, the northern shores of the Black and Willow in, in Zambia. And Judas is an extraordinary chap. He, he runs the Michael Lyons program there. Jerry, are you going to talk about this? Do I need to skip details here? Sure. I don't want to steal your thunder. Sure. Okay. And recently, disaster befell Judas. It's unthinkable, isn't it? Uh, and, you know, he, he lost a lot. And we were talking about this uh, within the Rocker World Executive and, and with Jerry and said, so, well, you know, he'd, he'd taken a loan, he bought some animals, and, and they'd all died. And we're saying, well, this is a great guy. We've got to get behind this guy. What do we do? Do we forget the loan that he's taken? Or do we give him, uh, you know, send him some money so he can replace these things? And in the meantime, he came back to Jerry and he said, Jerry, and I'm paraphrasing here, of course, you know what? Even though this has been incredibly hard on me, what an opportunity for me to grow my relationship with God. And to grow in... in trust and faith in him and I'm thankful for that opportunity to do that well boy did we get it wrong you know we, we were ready to just roll in there and solve his problem and he looked to God in the club that built sustainability it's that sort of thing that we can so easily undo by marching in there with our pockets full of cash and removing the need of the poor to rely on God and we cannot allow ourselves to be in that position either. We just can't do that. It's not sustainable. Okay, the third aspect I want to talk about is sustainability. Partnership, not dominance. Power is a very interesting thing. Power is not something that we give a lot of thought to. And do you know why? Because we have lots of it. By the sheer fact that you were born in this country, that you're able to be here of your own volition, that you could afford to come tonight, you've got lots of power. You've got power coming out of your ears. And people with power don't think about power. But people who don't have power think about power a great deal. And when we who have power go into worlds and communities and cultures that, that don't have a lot of power, we, we often create chaos. We, we, we don't understand what's going on. We don't understand the power that we wield in these places. And we can just bulldoze people. We, can, we think we're doing great stuff. We think we're building great relationships. In fact, we're just dominating people. And I want to read a, a little story. When I was thinking about this, it reminded me of a story. And again, going back to the old uh, faithful, I, th I think this is from when helping her to memory to but I'm going to read it verbatim, because I think it's it's uh, it's a good story. It's a story of the elephant and the mouse. Anyone ever heard the story of the elephant and the mouse? 
and it's told by an African storyteller. He says, Elephant and Mouse were best friends. One day Elephant said, Mouse, let's have a party. Animals gathered from far and near. They ate, they drank, they sang, they danced, and nobody celebrated more and da danced harder than Elephant. After the party was over, Elephant exclaimed, Mouse, did you ever go to a better party? What a blast! The mouse did not respond. <laughs> mouse, where are you? Elephant called. He looked around for his friend and then he shrank back in horror. There at Elephant's feet lay Mouse. His little body was ground into the dirt. He had been smashed by the big feet of his exuberant friend Elephant. The African storyteller said, Sometimes this is what it is like to do mission with you Westerners. <laughs> it is like dancing with an elephant. <laughs> That's what we do. That's what we do. We go into these places. We have the best of intentions. We're not trying to hurt anyone. But we dominate. We dominate. And so whatever these people are thinking, whatever their strategies and aspirations are, we come in and we go, Oh! Let me tell you about my experience. I'm a management consultant, and so I know all about business. So let me tell you what you need to do. I've taken teams of people into the, into the field and heard comments not unlike that. Let me tell you what you need to do. How on earth would we know? How on earth would we know? We're just elephants going around stomping on mice. And that doesn't build sustainability at all. It's just dominance. And so part of the discipline, part of what Pat and Judy, Jerry and Haley, and, and Mark and Emma, all of our partnership facilitators are really good, is not allowing themselves to be absorbed in that power. Not, a, not taking it on and accepting all the power that's potentially hidden on their shoulders. But just pushing things. Saying, no, no, no. You, you're the centre of this. Not, not me. That's what our partnership facilitators are really good at. I hope, I hope you all get the chance to see some of our partnership facilitators in action sometimes. And, and, and Kevin and Helen are, are right at the tippy top of the pyramid there. They're awesome. And just, just gently handing that power back to the people in the field. It's awesome. We can't allow ourselves to take on that power because we can't wield it responsibly. We can't understand the local context unless we live in it. And I mean really live in it. Generationally. We don't know what's going on. So we just march in with our big ideas and we can destroy people. And that is what's their strategies that rule, not our strategies that rule. We don't know. That's, that's the whole basis for our ministry. Is, is we're an organization that, that puts the onus and responsibility to figure out what on earth to do in the community with our partners because we just don't know. And if we tried to push our ideas, they would probably go horribly wrong. So, what are the alternatives to a relationship in which we have all the power and exert dominance over our partners? Well, the first thing we need to do is promote self-confidence in our partners. We need, to, we need to remind them how strategic and important and, and special and gifted and, and talented they are. And this picture is a picture of a place called the Friends Fashion Centre. It's a controversial partner of ours. And uh, I've been reminded recently of this lesson. Now, this is a partner that we've, we've invested quite a bit of money into. It's a garment factory in Lahore, in Pakistan. And uh, I, I went and visited them a number of years ago with, with Kevin. Uh, we should be together. We should know that. It's kind of, it's kind of a badge of honour in Bright Oak World when you've shared a bed with Kevin. You're there, you've made it. I just want to be clear that that only applies to the guys. That's... <laughs> <laughs> and this partner has struggled. We've struggled to get information out of them. We've struggled to, to kind of make the whole model work. And we've gone back and forth, back and forth. And about a year ago, the information stopped coming. And, and by my calculations, they'd run out of money. And that was probably the end of it. And Kevin had tried several times, like Paul, to travel there. And it just hadn't happened. And then finally, he'd just been recently. And you know what? It's going really well. It's, it's doing fine. It's doing fine without us. I mean, they want to grow and they're looking for more investment. We're still a bit unsure about it. But they're doing okay. They, they had a vision. 
and they've plugged away at it. And by our standards, it's it's kind of a, you know, it's just got a bum, bumbling along. But these guys are working diligently, and there's a hundred people that have been trained in their factory to go out and work, and and the amount of money they're they're paid and they're earning, it's almost a concern to us because it's 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 so high. They're doing really well. That's part of sustainability as well. Is we just sometimes we need to just let these guys do what they do. We don't mm. always have all the answers. We haven't always figured out what's going to work and what's not. The other thing that we can do in this space of, of ensuring partnership and not dominance is promote local local leadership, not external influence. And this is a picture that really makes me smile. This is a guy called Sahail. He's Jordanian. This picture was taken in Amman in Jordan. And Sahel is one of the key people in a ministry called Manara that works with primarily Iraqi uh, refugees in Jordan. And they, they have good connections around the world and they get sent stuff from well-meaning people who send containers of things to them. And what Sahel is holding up there, to his amusement and mine, is an electric toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> and behind him, are about a container's worth of boxes of electric toothbrushes, which at considerable cost, Manara cleared through customs, not knowing what was inside, from, well, I was going to say the country, but from a country. <laughs> and they have to go through that process and accept what comes. They paid for a container, a shipping container, a 40 foot shipping container. They paid an exorbitant amount to clear a shipping container full of bottled water to bring it into the country. The amount that they paid to clear that shipping container through customs in Jordan was significantly more than it would have cost to go down to the local shop in Jordan and buy bottled water, which you can do fairly easily. But they had to go and pay for that. And they can't say no because the elephant at the other end is saying, but I sent you some water and electric toothbrushes, how was that? How oh, awesome am I? Look what I did. And these guys just smile and say, oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Well, we, that's not what we want to see happen. The leadership needs to be local. It needs to be the people on the ground. It needs to be Sahail that's telling us what he needs, not us saying, we're sending him uh, boxes and boxes of dried spaghetti. Which, as you know, is a big part of, of the Iraqi diet. <laughs> <laughs> Local leadership, <laughs> not external input. Now, the last aspect <clears throat> that I want to talk about, uh, and this, this, is a, this is a tricky subject of sustainability, of what's really important to us, what's in our heart, is being field driven, not me driven. Which, folks, it is very, very, very tempting to put ourselves in the middle of this process. It is a trend self-driven mission. Mission that is about me and what I want to get out of contributing, going, participating. My sense of identity, my sense of significance, my calling, my place in the world. I want to, to be involved with something significant. All of these things, all, all true and, and, and right and good things. But when that is what drives mission, it's not sustainable. When our emotions are what drive mission, it's not sustainable. Because you know what? Our emotions change. We get bored. We want something new. It's an addiction. And anyone who's had an addiction will tell you the same thing does not continue to satisfy that addiction. You want more and more. I, I, I need to be closer. I need to be a more part of it. I need to go now. You know, I, I visited. Now I need to go live with these people and be the center of it. It, it, it escalates. Like addictions do, and it's toxic because we have no place being at the center of missions. God is at the center of missions. Our partners are right there. Our partners are our focus in missions. We have no place supplanting God and the recipients of, of God's blessing with our emotional needs. Shame on us. We would ever do that. Woe to the person who would push the poor out of the centre of ministry and put themselves in that place. Shame on us if we would ever do that. We have no place being there. But you know what? Even for the best of us, it is 
very, very easy and tempting to subtly pursue strategies that give us a bigger emotional payoff. Sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it. We have a choice between A and B, and A would be a little bit better for the partners. It would be a little bit more of what they need. But B is better for us. B's a better story. B's got better pictures. B is exciting. We'll go with B. It's a mistake. Could even be a sin. It's wrong. We have no place being the central mission. It's not our problem. It's not our problem. This may be the most important thing I say, probably is. We're there to serve them. They are not there to serve us. We are called by God to serve the poor as the poor. They are not called to serve us. They are not there to entice and excite and entertain and inspire us. It's not fair to put them in that position. Many of our partners no longer receive financial support from us. That's awesome. When we have partners for whom we are, and this is, this is a nice term, for whom we are financially obsolescent, that's awesome. We, we're not needed anymore. They don't need our money. That's, that's a goal for us. Fantastic. They're, they're, they're doing their own thing. They're participating in the, in the economy, and they're going out, and they're doing it, and we get to hear their stories, and it's exciting, and we're connected relationally, and we just love it. And we have part of people really close to us that just don't get that. Who say, but I've been on your website, and a bunch of the, the partnerships on your website, you, you're not giving them anymore. Well, you should take those off. What? Our partners. What, that's what defines partnership, is that we continue to give them money? No, that's a partnership. Not at all. We're, we're connected with these guys. These are our friends. We want to continue to tell these stories. And if they don't, they don't need us financially anymore, that's awesome, because it's not about us. If, if we don't get the payoff of the thing, oh, we, we did that. That's our, we paid for that. Good. Good. Makes it easier for us not to, to steal the glory of God. That's really important to us. Because we do not want to become addicted to being needed. That's not sustainable. That destroys organisations like ours. It destroys lives. This end and that end. So what are some alternatives to putting ourselves in the middle of helping the poorest of the poor? Well, the first thing we want to do is promote their significance, not ours. Glory to God and, and respect and, and focus on the people that are doing the work fielding, not on us. Now, I, I, this is a picture from, this is a wonderful girl called Pinky, who's at a school in, in Siliguri in India. And this is the exception of the rule. Because this is the bright hope in the school. And, and we illustrate that because India is one of those places where we really don't want them to talk about us. We don't want our name on things. But Indians really love to do that, to, to, to honour us. And so that's the bright hope in the school. But we don't want our name on anything. We don't want anyone other than the partner to know that we're involved. We don't want any of the people here to know that we're involved. We don't need to be recognised in those communities. Is there, What's that got to do with anything? We don't need our name on it. We want our partners to be respected in those communities. We don't want people to go, well, you've got cool money from those bright hope world people. That's not what we're about. We want them to be seen as significant in those communities, to be leaders in those communities. Not disempowered because we have to have our name all over everything and feel good about that. And the other thing that we really want to do is promote their aspirations, not ours, even if it doesn't give us a payoff. And this is something I found out about. There's a picture I took just a, a few months ago when it was there with me. This, this is a really interesting uh, group up in the north of Thailand. And we've done a bunch of microloans programs uh, up there, but when we were there, we heard about this, this new group that the, the woman on the right in the camo jacket had formed. And they've got all these... Corinne women together that weave, and they form this really sophisticated cooperative. And they all pay in to get raw materials to weave these, these wonderful shirts and, and, and clothes and bags, and they sell it and they share the profits to, to, to support and help each other. It's just this wonderful idea that they've come up with. And we had nothing to do with it. I mean, it's loosely connected with it, but they just went off and did it. 
That's what excites <laughs> us. It's like, wow, really? Did you? Fantastic. Mm. It's not about us. We don't. We don't need to get upset about that. It's like, well, we didn't know. No one told us about it. We, we could have put a picture up somewhere and told the story. It's, it's awesome. There's not enough to there. Thing. And that's what has to happen for sustainability to happen. Is, is these things go off and, and we're not holding them back because of how it makes us feel. So, those are some of the key aspects of sustainability. Why? That was the, the here we are, Five minutes later, and I'm finally asking the question that was at the heading of the session. Why do we pursue sustainability? I'm going to throw these things up pretty quickly. The first thing is put some certainty into uncertain lives. When people have to keep waiting to see whether Bright Hope World is going to renew the budget, or will Bright Hope World you know, fund my thing, or will Bright Hope World be able to get the funds for the thing to fund my thing, it's just uncertainty. But when people say, well, you know, my... my Small business is going really well. I can put a roof on my house. That's much better. We don't, we don't, we don't want them to be reliant on us. We want them to be reliant on God. We want them to work with their own hands. That's way better. That's why we pursue sustainability. It's better. And give some dignity and power to those that don't have it. I said before to say to him, you've got your hand out, it robs you of something. When you can provide for your own needs, it does something special for people. Give some power. There's some dignity. We like that. We think that's how everyone should be able to live. It strengthens relationships with God when people are reliant on God instead of reliant on us. It strengthens relationships, strengthens communities. That should be pretty obvious. Remind us we are not God. We are not the rescuers. We're not the white knights. We're not the solvers of all problems. We can forget that. It's not our role. It allows the best ideas to be action because it doesn't have to be my idea. It doesn't have to be my idea to give me a sense of significance. Best idea. Ideas from, from the people who are actually there in local communities. It shows respect to sexual people because we're not dancing all over them. We're, we're, we're saying, you are awesome. That guy, Naranjan, if he lived in New Zealand, you would know his name because he'd be running a major company in this country. But when he does it, he wants to say and, and, and help his communities and, and give his life on that way. These are exceptional people, and we don't need to be dominated. They deserve our respect. And it puts the focus where it should be, in, in the hands of the people that have the visions from God, and to rely on God to enact those visions. So, why do we pursue sustainability? Well, ultimately, we do it to empower the poorest of the poor to be able to confidently provide for their own spiritual and physical needs. So they can thrive. That's why we do it. Because that's, that's what we think works best in the long run for future generations. But it's not just, and I, I just want to close off quickly by, by talking about that value that we, we exercise sustainability. It's not just at the field end. And you're going to hear a little bit about this tomorrow as well. We also pursue sustainability within our team because we want to keep doing what we're doing. We don't want to fall over and end up with, with no one here to, to ring the bell and fly the flag. And we also pursue it with our, with our donors. We, we pursue sustainability in relationship with our donors so that we can continue to do what we're doing. So let me talk about that point. We made a decision, or we, we codified something that already existed. You know, we just gave it a name, which is to say, we take our time with our partners. I mean, we, if you've heard anyone talk about Right Hope, we always say, thanks, two years form a partnership out in the, in the field. We do our due diligence, we build a relationship, we take our time, but that partnership lasts. We stick with it to the bitter end. Well, you know, we, we kind of decided as a team, that's what we want at the, the donor end as well. We're not, we're not looking just to, to do some big appeal and just have a bunch of people, you know, you know support us in a, in a non-relational way. This is what we want. We want to have the same kind of connections with the people that have stood before God and said, I want to invest in the kingdom of God. I want to invest in, in helping for us to the poor and building sustainability into those communities. And we want to build a relationship with that end and take people on a journey with us and share about what God's doing and have that kind of relationship and commitment and partnership at both ends. Isn't that an awesome model? To, to think we've got people here, we can connect with people here. It's just it's what we're, we're striving for. 
So we're looking for like-minded people that want to go on that journey with us. That's why we, we talk about all this stuff. We want to say, is this, does this resonate with you? Is what we're talking about make sense to you? Then let, let's talk some more, because we, we, we want to partner with people like that. And uh, that's why you're here, uh, I'm guessing. And we're not looking for short-term engagement. We're not looking for corporate donations from companies that have nothing to do with God, for the most part. We get criticised for that a little bit, but we're looking for people that really understand who we are and what we're about, and we'll really invest in our partners. Because development takes time. We, we, we can't do this with fly by nine. It just doesn't work. And here's why. This is a diagram that's up on our website. And it's, it's, it's a great way to kind of understand how what we do works. I hope you can hear me. I'm going to walk away from the mic. There's four phases in, in the kind of ministry space that we're in. The first is relief. Relief is a crisis. It's a war. It's an earthquake. It's a famine. And the focus of relief is just to meet urgent need. Crisis need. Then you move into... And that's about getting people back to where they were before the crisis hit. Just bringing people back up to equilibrium. Development is about transforming communities, about taking communities to another level, about starting to alleviate poverty in communities. And then advocacy is really just trying to change the whole system. Just, just advocating for justice and, and, and those really big picture aspects that contribute to poverty. A lot of the time frames. Relief is about months and years. How long does a, a, a crisis story stay on the news in New Zealand? Days. And then we've forgotten. We can't even do that bit. That's the short term bit. And we can't keep our focus on that. Rehabilitation takes years. Have you heard about Haiti? Like, did you, you realise how long ago that was? It's not any better. Because we all forgot about it. Most of the world did. They are still struggling in that phase. Christchurch. How long has it been since our earthquake? Have you been in the central city? If you haven't, spoiler alert, it's not <laughs> and, and we have resources to burn. Development takes decades. Advocacy is generations. This is us. This is where we live. Decades. When we're forming a relationship with, with, with individuals, with churches, we're talking about partnerships that will go for decades. It's not easy to get people to commit to things for decades. It's a real challenge for us. Because that's, that's the kind of thing. Come with us. Come on a journey. Don't give up when it gets tough, when it gets boring, when... when Pictures start looking the same because development takes decades. It doesn't. It doesn't turn on a dime. It's not change every month. It's not how it works. Rob's going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow and some of the challenges when you're dealing with those kind of time frames. When you when you're trying over decades to make things sustainable. And then there's sustainability in our team. Now again, I'm going to touch on this very briefly because I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. Not paying the team may seem like a terrible idea for sustainability. What's our plan? Well, we ask a great deal of people and give them nothing in return. That is our plan for sustainability. But you know what? Not, not paying people. Having a team of people who are passionate, who would give everything for our partners, does not put a dent in sustainability. It puts a big line underneath. The way that we do things, and I can say this without fear of contradiction, is far more sustainable than having a team of six-figure salary people. Now, I, I just realised I've, I've, I've dented a discussion question we're going to have later, but we'll, we'll just ignore that I said that. <coughs> Sustainability in our team is something that is very, very important to us. And our team sacrifices a great deal, far more than you realise. They give up a lot to be here, to visit our partners, to work diligently with them, not just when they're there, but back here, constantly in communication with our partners. They give up a lot. They give up family life. They give up involvement at church. They give up a great deal. And they're awesome people. You'll get to meet them over the next uh, wee while. And they are awesome people. And 
our focus on sustainability in the team is growing that team so that we can have an even bigger and more dedicated team of people. It's really, really important to us that we continue to do what we're doing. And I can tell you they're not here that, because it's a job, but because they're compelled by a vision. Probably the same reason you're here. They are compelled by our vision. They live and eat and breathe it. I can tell you that from personal experience. You know the great thing? Not once has the board of Bright Hope World ever told me I need to raise more funds to pay for the salaries for our team. And not many executive directors of non-profits can say that. So I'm, I'm quite happy about that. So, that's sustainability. That's why we pursue sustainability. We want to keep doing what we're doing. We want to keep seeing our partners thrive. And so over the next uh, day, tomorrow, you're going to hear quite a bit more on that subject. And I just want to, just to finish off, I just want to direct you to the attention, uh, direct your attention to the program tomorrow. Uh, Eva's going to be talking about sustainability in the field, the strategies that we pursue. And Kevin's going to talk about uh, the people that we work with and how the people are very special and contribute to sustainability. I'm going to talk a little bit more about our team with a very special presentation from Jerry Field on uh, being bivocational, which I'm very much looking forward to. Um, and throughout the morning, we, you know, I've told a couple of stories, but you're going to hear a lot of stories from our partners, and that's, that's the stuff that's cool. That's the stuff that we really like to hear. So uh, if you're thinking about whether or not to come back tomorrow, please do, because you'll hear some great stories. And then we're going to hear about challenges to sustainability from Rob and from Kevin. And we've also got one of our partners um, that's coming in to talk with us tomorrow from Mozambique. A wonderful, wonderful man, so he's going to talk a little bit about tomorrow. So I've said more than enough. What is, what is the time? I'm, I'm sure it's very late, uh, 8.43. I'd really love to, if, if you've got another 15 or 20 minutes in you, I'm not going to talk, I'm having to laugh. I, I, we've got some discussion questions I'd like to put up, maybe just to reflect on some of these things. So I'm going to put them up. And if, if you want to, if we have coffee, get up. Yeah, we have coffee, so it's all good. We have coffee, grab a cup of coffee, and I really encourage you, I'll leave these up here, to have a talk about some of these issues. You know, we want to do this throughout tomorrow, put some discussion questions in, in front of you, and, and just encourage you to wrestle with some of these things, because, you know, we're, we're you know, particularly me, can be quite dogmatic about these things, and go, this, this is just how it is. There's no other side of the argument. But in fact, wisdom would suggest that some of these things are not black and white. And we would really encourage you to talk in groups about some of these issues and maybe take some notes. And we'd love to see what you think. It, it means a lot to us. We, we get isolated in our little worlds and we love to reach out and find out what other people think about these things that we harp on about. So, some discussion questions. When sustainability isn't happening in the field, what do you think it would look like? What do you think it looks like when, when things are not sustainable in the in the field. Are there ways we as Western churches and donors might be subtly contributing to dependency or short term focus in ways that I haven't explored? And, and dare I say it, and it, like, I'm not looking for you know, self punitive reflection here, but are, are there things maybe that, that we have done ourselves, this group, that maybe we could do better in the future? And if we don't need to rescue people, what we, should we do in chronic and non-emergency poverty situations? How do, we, how do we address these things? How do we get involved in a way that is productive and promotes dependency without just sitting back and being too afraid to do anything because you read wind helping hurts and it scared the living heck out of you and, and you don't want to do anything? We, what do we do? How do we get involved? And we would love to hear back from you on those things. So I'm going to pray to finish. I'd encourage you to have a cup of coffee and we would dearly love to see you here tomorrow a little bit before nine to hear more from us. Okay, let's pray. Father God, we just pause and reflect and remind ourselves that this is all for you. That you are what counts. That we are here because you love us. We serve you because we love you. And Lord, we just we're moved by compassion for the poorest of the poor and we just humbly want to serve them in whatever way we can 
And Lord, I just pray that you would inspire us, you would drive us on to do more, to draw closer to you, to just be a positive influence in this world and to listen to you and heed your call to remember the poor of the widow, the orphan and the man. Father God, please give us good rest tonight. We thank you for these wonderful people who have given up a weekend to be with us. And we just pray that you would open our hearts and minds for whatever you want to say tonight. Thank you. Amen. Amen.